Bob Hartzik, you are an unbelievable and leader who has built an acclaimed career in higher education and as an entrepreneur of the highest order. Growing up, you didn't have much money, but you were determined enough to attend college. You enrolled at what is now Emporia State University, just down the street from the house that you were raised in. Politics has long been a passion of yours, and so you formed a coalition as you moved to the campus for the first time with a good friend, Larry Beers, to run for different roles in student government, and lo and behold, you both won. Larry also happened to be a SIG EP, and between him and your position on the Union Activities Council, you found yourself surrounded by SIG EPs on a regular basis and you soon became one yourself. You earned a degree in economics from Emporia State in 1970 and then went off to graduate school. After completing your master's degree, you started a new job as Dean of Students at Colby Community College in Colby, Kansas, and were also named a State Education Commissioner. All this happened all this happened when you were only 21 years old. In this role, you and two other commissioners distributed the federal construction money to community colleges all across Kansas. Just nine months later, the college appointed you to be vice president, making you the youngest vice president in an executive position of an institution of higher education in the country. Next came law school, where you served as the executive editor of the Law Journal. When you graduated, you took a position as an executive vice president of the Kansas Engineering Society, a move that ended up helping you find what your really true passion and career would be. You helped launch a very small fundraising campaign, getting your first taste and exposure to the field that would become your life's work. You took that knowledge and returned to higher education with a vengeance, first serving as the Vice President for Development at Washburn University, and then as Vice President for Development, Alumni and University Relations at Wichita State University. Your role as the top administrator and fundraiser for those institutions led you to become more involved in fundraising and at Washburn, you eventually oversaw a $21 million capital campaign. The dean of the law school at the time credited you, Bob, with saving the law school that was facing tremendous economic pressures. Later in the mid-80s, at Wichita State University, you spearheaded an even larger campaign, bringing in a little more than $100 million and that was 30 years ago when $100 million was a lot of money. Because of that campaign, you realized that you could start your own fundraising and consulting company. So in 1987, you formed what now is known as Arts of Companies with yourself and just two other employees. Based on a simple formula, hard work, dedication, and ambition to create something very special. You believe that people support what they help create, and there is no security, there's just opportunity in life. 30 years later, your company now has advised over 6,000 nonprofits, helping raise billions of dollars, and not just several billion, we're at 231 billion and counting. Parts of companies now have over 50 employees and is one of the top fundraising management firms in the world. And it has been employee owned since 2005 because you wanted to share with the people that made you successful. Since selling the company, though, to your employees, you haven't slowed down a bit. You've continued to lead your company as president and CEO while writing three books. In the latest, entitled 231 Million Raised and Still Counting, which 
You were very nice enough to provide copies to everyone in the legislative session today. You share some of your greatest success stories from your three decades in the industry leading as a leading fundraiser. And you've also started other businesses to help nonprofits recruit and hire the very best executives that they could find. In addition to building organizations, finding funding, you are also a major contributor to the cause that you so very, very passionately are committed to. You've invested over $30 million in education and research to better understand and advance philanthropy and the desire to promote the welfare of others. In 2007, because of your generous support and to honor your dedication to the art of fundraising, Indiana University established the country's very, very first academic chair in fundraising. The mission of the Robert F. Hartzik Chair in Fundraising is to study the ethics of fundraising and what motivates donors to give so that nonprofits can raise money more efficiently and more effectively. You also partner with Avila University, home of the top rank Hartzik Fundraising Master's Degree Program, and with Plymouth University in England to develop the world's very first PhD program in fundraising. Bob Hartzik, you've transformed fundraising and the fundraising industry. You're a world-renowned professional, and so many institutions have benefited from your work. It's, we tried to list them, it'd be impossible. You have an honorary doctorate from Plymouth University now, so we can call you Dr. Bob. A Distinguished Alumnus Award from Emporia State, your alma mater. The Spirit of Philanthropy Award from Indiana University and being recognized by the Wall Street Journal as Philanthropist of the Year. Tonight, we add an accolade to your resume, your prestigious resume. You have made unprecedented mark on the world of fundraising, enabling good to be done, and you've changed that world forever. Brother Bob, it is our pleasure to confer upon you the Sigma Phi Epsilon Citation, Bob Hartzig. that guy Ed was talking about. Seemed like a pretty, ooh, that's a horrible picture. Get that off the, we're not gonna, you promised no recent picture. This is, the picture on the back of your book is my picture. I'm actually not here. But he, he is somewhere doing work, making me money, and, and accomplishing a great deal. Uh, I've known Ed for a long time. So this is not a, uh, an opportunity to uh, be recognized, just is of greater significance to me because of Ed's uh, making the introduction. And, and so I thank you, Ed, for that. I thank Ed for really bringing me into the fraternity. I was not a freshman pledge, as Ed shared with you. I was a junior. And, and like uh, my fellow recipient, there are great stories. If you think they were wild in 87, you should think of them in 67. And so we aren't going to dwell on that very much. Brian came to see me, what, about six months ago, eight months ago, at my place in North Carolina. And, and I was mesmerized about his dream and the Sigma Phi Epsilon of today. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the Sigma Phi Epsilon of yesterday. It means a lot to me. The relationships mean a lot to me. The opportunities mean a lot to me. But I have to admit, I'm energized about the Sigma Phi Epsilon 
of tomorrow. And I want you all to applaud that. For those of you who think that I should be wearing a tie, that's too bad. You'll get over it. <laughs> many, many have. I have a, a well-known uh, client in DC in which I'm the chief fundraising counsel for them. It's a very sophisticated group. I'm not gonna name them because they're a little edgy. But we made a deal not long ago that I wasn't gonna wear a tie. And they said to me, as long as you're smarter than we are at this, then you don't have to wear a tie. And so I'm still not wearing a tie. It's also very rare for me to wear a sport coat. So I am wearing a sport coat. It almost buttons in the front. It, uh, it's a very important sport coat that you all should think about because we've all watched on television thanks to these media fr new friends of mine, of all the problems on airlines, haven't you? I mean, just some horrible things. I, I am a 16 million mile person with American Airlines. That's not funny, you're right. <laughs> so I've seen it all. But because I normally don't wear a sport coat, I had, and I'm getting a little older, and even though I value my memory greatly, my greatest fear, Brian, was that I would leave it on the airplane. If you could look in pants, I had notes, do you have your sport coat? If I, have, if I had my iPhone, I, I had to make a connection. I have a driver in Kansas City who looks after me when I'm at our, our home office, and he was instructed at three o'clock yesterday afternoon to text me, to ask me, do you still have your sport coat? So, so that tells you I'm surrounded by people who look after me and take care of me, and I, and I believe in all of them. But this airline story is something you need to know because you hear all the horrible elements of airlines. So I got on, as, as Mary just saw, I'm kind of a friendly guy. I talk to people. I'm blessed to be able to spend most of my time in first class. I take that back. My contract is I spend all my time in first class. <laughs> And that was part of the deal. Did you get that, Chuck, with your, Charles, with your uh, deal? You got first class, see? It's a good thing. When, you, when you're both, I'm a 70 graduate. Um, so, but I was obsessed about my coat. So when I walked on the second leg, the flight attendant, very nice woman, took my coat. And I said, I'm going to get this award tomorrow, and my greatest fear is that I won't have my coat. And she was very nice. And so as some of you who may be aware, I'm a little obsessive. So every time she would bring a drink or walk by, I would ask her, what is it that you're supposed to remind me of? And she would dutifully say, your sport coat. And I have your sport coat. And so when we landed in Orlando, and she brought me my sport coat, the all of first class said, did you get Bob his sport coat? <laughs> so my point is, there are a lot of good things that go on on airlines, and there are a lot of good people uh, who, who look after you. And one of those is Ed. Uh, you all know him. Well, I don't know that you know him better than I do. I know him pretty well. Uh, I've watched this man. I've watched him. I, I was in the director of alumni office uh, at Emporia State. We were five years apart when he got his job. And I don't know whether it was at uh, Louisville or at what was the Seton Hall or at Seton Hall. But the alumni director had got a letter from his wife saying, we just got this new job and we're doing great. So I knew he was doing great, <laughs> and that things were, going, things were going well. And I watched him, I'm very proud that, and I don't know that he knew what was gonna happen in our lives together, but the Fort Hayes State University, when I started Hartsook and that little company, 
was one of our first three clients. And that was six hour drive from Wichita clients, Kansas. And I wasn't flying first class. Did have some pretty nice cars, but, but wasn't flying first class. He is one of the most innovative college presidents and leaders I've ever been around. We share a lot of the similar attitudes of life. And Ed, you know what I'm doing, but I thought about this would be a good occasion for me to announce that I'm working with the Board of Regents in Kansas to establish the Ed Hammond Presidential Fellow Award given to creative university presidents throughout America that will come and spend a week in Kansas. So, I, I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, fortunate to have time and money to spend time thinking about a lot of what goes on in our society. My company interacts with colleges, healthcare, but it also interacts with that wonderful story we had of our, of our fellow this year in the social service world. I've seen it all. We do business all over the world. And Ed, we have 100 employees, not 50. That matters. Now, maybe for the IRS, we're just under 50. <laughs> now that I think about that. <laughs> we maybe have some more contractors. I take all that back. I shouldn't have said that. That's not, <laughs> we're not recording this, are we? Uh, I, I am very proud. $231 billion is a lot. I was stunned when we had our 30th anniversary last year and our research staff came up with that number. 6,000 nonprofits worldwide, most in the United States, of all shapes, from a domestic violence shelter, to a homeless shelter, to a boys and girls club, to a college, to a university, to a hospital, to symphonies, an opera. And I have one great belief as I ponder this world that we work in for charity, is that our ultimate goal, which I believe is Sigma Phi Epsilon's ultimate goal, is to create good citizens. You can say it a lot of different ways, but if you come out of a homeless shelter, shouldn't your question be, how have we helped you become a better citizen? If you graduate from a college, how have we helped you be a better citizen? If you've seen an opera for the first time, how has that helped you become a better citizen? And, and I'm frankly dedicating this phase of my life to studying that and creating accountability in the nonprofit world. I live by the SIGEP rules, but I've added a few, and, and you're gonna hear them. And they're real simple. I don't do anything that is illegal, immoral, unethical, or discriminatory. Other than that, I have no rules. And when you live by those four rules, it is amazing what you can do. Because as, as Ed said, I do believe, I was told as I left Colby Community College to go to law school, I was told by the president, by the president of the board, a doc, Floyd Smith, he said, you know, Bob, I think you, I, I've left a job, a vice president, it was a small college at 24 years old, that people have spent careers wanting to, to attain, and I was abandoning it to go to law school. And he said, Bob, you've learned something that few in life ever learn. There is no security. There is only opportunity. And that guiding light has, has let me, lit my path forever. I always look at it that way. It also stole one of my lines of, People support what they help to create. Think about that. The, the key to success, in my view, just a few thoughts. I believe in curiosity. I'm interested. I'm interested in other people. Unfortunately, they sit next to me on airplanes and have to be subjected 
as much to my asking questions. And I had two engineers sitting next to me. I'm not an engineer, by the way. Two engineers sitting next to me. And the engineers don't talk a lot. You notice that? I mean, I was the first head of an engineering trade association in the country as a non-engineer. And that was because they have opinions. And of course, I'm a lawyer, so I have absolutely no opinions at all. Tell me what you want me to be. But I sat next to two engineers, but I pried it out of them. I sat next to an engineer who runs a tool and die operation in Maryland and was telling me about how his business is doing and that his father created it 40 years ago, that his son's in the business, that his mother, his wife's in the business, his, his daughter's in the business. He told me about their employees and what their role and the kind of relationships they've built. Then I sat next to Leonard. Leonard was a young Af is a young African American, three master's degrees and a bachelor's degree in uh, uh, engineering and an MBA. He told me, which has not proven to be true, that Bob, you can take your coat off when you speak. That was a joke, guys. Come on, <laughs> lighten it up here, my wow. lord. But. We have Leonard now with his wife in Orlando and their three-year-old daughter, Holly. We now have Leonard on a path for a new PhD in the field of business because he knows in order for him to grow, he has a unique opportunity. And that was an hour-long conversation where I learned about his life and his struggles and his opportunity. And he went to... Uh, Missouri School of Mines, which is near Kansas, mentioned that. But what, he, what I find is curiosity is the way in which you can best learn from others and take advantage of it. The last two is one from Sam Walton. Sam Walton wrote in his book when he retired, shortly before he died, that opportunity frequently lies in the opposite direction of where everybody else is going. Most of you may not realize that Target, Kmart, and Walmart were all created in the same year. I rest my case. <laughs> so today, I thank you, Ed. I thank Brian. I thank the membership. I appreciate your indulgence in my character or caricature, and I, and I promise to pass on, not to that guy, put up that other picture. I like that other picture. Because he's at home, and I'll stream and tell him what a great crowd you were and how much you appreciate it. Thank you all very much. <laughs>